Hello and welcome to the Echo Chamber Podcast. My name is Tony Groves and today I'm giving out yards without no one even noticed I was away, Martin. What the hell? I th- look, I think you look great. I think that time in the cell with Tony Robinson, I think the two <laughs> did well, actually. I think you look great. <laughs> But not guilty. <laughs> free, free. Tommy, Tommy got out on bail. I, 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 I don't so know how. He lost I a bit of weight and, and shaped up nicely. We didn't wait some that together. Oh no, I was just <laughs> sick of sweat box. <laughs> uh, listen, I'm, I, 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 I'm laughing, but we, you know, we, are, I am joined by my co-host and the man who spent the last month living on my couch, Martin. You used up all the toilet roll. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have to. Uh, much more importantly, we're delighted to be joined in the tortoise shack by UCC graduate. American, <laughs> American via a Corkman via 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 uh, the United States, uh, lecturer lecturer of GP GP trainer and GP himself. Yeah. Um, now Stephen Doc Doctor Stephen Murphy to give you your full title. Stephen, when we first met, you said, "Feel like you already know you." It's gas how Twitter does that. We yeah. do we we, yeah. we we do know one another. Well, it's the humor, you know. I mean, I I picked up on your humor right away, which is pretty um. I don't know how would you describe your humor. Odd. <laughs> well, Odd, you're in yeah. very small. Clothes. Yeah, you get picked up on Tony's humor. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's usually it's usually Tony. You're not funny, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm laughing away to myself, which is why. why That's just Dublin people. They have no sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to aim at that that cork. American demographic, so that's yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a small it's, it's, market. It's, it's very, but it's funny because I was born in New York, which is, uh, you know, New Yorkers think they're the capital of the United States. Yeah. So they're like the Cork people. Yeah. Of yeah. The United States, and then I went to Cork and they discovered I was in the true capital, probably the capital of the world. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I would, I, like, I, I, did you, you ever hear the old joke where they, they said uh, young alien life was discovered, and they, 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 they hold a, a lotto to see who's going to. You know, represent the human race to meet the first alien ambassador, and the mayor of Cork wins, yeah. and he says, on, "On behalf of all of humankind, but more importantly, on behalf of the people of Cork." <laughs> <laughs> He's right to buy. Yeah. <laughs> no, listen. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, I, I know. Uh, I know. Martin, Martin brought you out in in in, in the hair dryer. Uh, so it's a pre- no, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty impressive car. <laughs> I, I'm sure one time it was a fashion <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna stay we're gonna kick off look we're gonna kick straight into it because i suppose i'd written down the phrase and we'd spoken briefly about this downstairs uh gp crisis what crisis yeah. you might want to uh inform the listeners what what i mean when i do say there is a there is a not only is there a uh, impending gp crisis it's already uh underway well, i mean i i mean one of the reasons why i wanted to do the podcast was because i feel that people don't quite understand what general practice is and maybe they don't um they don't it's not so much they don't understand what it is but maybe they don't understand its place in the the health system and more importantly i think our political leaders and maybe the hse aren't quite sure of it either it's the place of it but the crisis is that the numbers of gps that are required to serve the nation in the primary care setting is uh vanishing and there is in the next five to ten years, there is going to be um, a significant reduction in the number of full time GPs in the country. So, they're, they're full time GPs are GPs that would spend most of their time seeing patients in the community. Mm. And um, it's particularly significant in rural counties. And um, the problem is that the younger doctors are not going to replace them because. Uh, the cost of setting up a practice and the insecurity uh, surrounding the future of general practice in Ireland is such that they would be crazy to do it. So the entry costs are prohibitive. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, I was talking to a GP earlier today and we were just talking about, you know, this idea that, you know, younger doctors don't see a future in it, but older doctors don't see a future in it either. Like if, if you were nearing retirement, I think you'd be looking for an exit clause in general practice because you, you don't, you see an escalating workload with a diminishing return. Mm. And um, and it really does expose you to an awful lot of other problems. And uh, I think that's that's something that we really need to be very worried about. And this is in the this is in the back the backdrop it shouldn't be the backdrop, it should be to the fore. Yeah. But in the backdrop of, of a of a state that talks about 
rolling out free GP care for all yeah. over phasing it out. Yeah. Whereas we don't even have the, the it, it's, it comes back to what Sarah Burke told us in, around Slanchi Care that one of the key points of Slanchi Care that, that they haven't even considered is the amount of nurses we need to hire. Yeah. You know, we've managed to hire, I think it was 120. Yeah. We need something in the region of 3,000. Yeah. Well, I, I was listening to uh, uh, an interview with Sarah and, you know, they were talking about, I think it was uh, an analyst from UCC was saying that they're going to need a, a, about a 30% increase in the number of GPs that exist at the moment. That's full-time equivalents. Now, that's not part-time. That's full-time GPs. But they're going to need 89 to 90% increase in practice nurses. Mm. I mean, that's phenomenal. Mm. And, you know... Um, that, that's a huge recruitment. And I mean, you see the recruitment crisis that the HSE have in secondary care. I mean, where are we going to get the nurses for primary care? And, you know, and they're very necessary. They give vaccines. They, they help with the antenatals. Uh, they're intrinsic to the, my work day. I mean, I have two fantastic uh, practice nurses in, in, in Ashburn Family Practice. And, um, you know, without them, we wouldn't be able to operate effectively with patients. So I, I think we're in big, big trouble. I think, I think, the crisis has come. Mm. I think what, what we're looking now is ex, ex, ex existential. I think it's an existence thing. Mm. I think general practice is actually going to die. And if that dies, what's the alternative? Like, I don't mind if they have a plan. Show me the plan. Now, the NHS has announced that they're going to look for 200 new... They're going to actively try and actively recruit 200 new GPs into the NHS. And they're looking to Ireland to yeah. recruit GPs from there. 200 out of the Irish system is a whack out of the Irish system. If you if they get two hundred GPs out of Ireland, that's a huge loss. That could accelerate the the decline in GPs much quicker. Yeah, and you know there's an there's an undercurrent in the vibe with Brexit as well that you know it's you know Britain wants to return to a previous time. So there you know certainly the vibe I've been getting with reading a lot of the papers, and particularly the papers that are pro Brexit, is that. There is kind of almost a race issue going on in England about, you know, a time when England might have been more white than coloured or mixed, let's say, if you like. And, you know, who are they going to look for? You know, where are they going? which countries are they going to favour if they're going to go for GPs? They're going to go for GPs from a predominantly um, white country like English Ireland, speaking. you know, English speaking. Yeah. I mean, look, we, we train the same way as the British. We speak English the same way. Um, you know, you, you know. Irish doctors are all over the NHS system. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think uh, from that point of view, I, I think we're going to be very headhunted by the UK. Uh, really now, the, the other thing about the the healthcare or the, the, the general practice at the present moment is the pressures, the added pressures that have been put on general practice in recent times. General practice now is not what general practice was. 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Yeah. There's huge changes. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, I'm, I'm, I, we're actually 20 years open in Ashburn this year. And, like, you know, I talked to my partner, Ashley, about, um, you know, the change in general practice since we, we started um, in, in, in uh, 1998. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, the, the level of workload that we need per patient is, has increased. And that's because... The dynamic of the country has, increased, has changed substantially. I mean, we're getting an older population with more chronic morbidity, morbidity. But the other problem is that secondary care is no longer managing chronic care the way it used to. I mean, we used to have functioning diabetic clinics where patients could go to the secondary care and get their diabetic care done. They were clinics. Now it's nearly impossible to get people onto diabetic clinic lists. Um, you know, so that's all supposed to come into general practice. There's no increased funding coming into general practice to compensate for this increased workload. And yet I see the budget increasing year on year in secondary care, you know, and, you know, that money is not following the patient. That money is not coming from secondary care out into the community so that we can do this work. But there's other issues. Like, I mean, if you look at the issue, if you look at the issue of, let's say, the waiting list, okay? When I started in general practice in Ashburn, there might have been a very long waiting list for ENT and maybe orthopedics. There, you know, there is a long waiting list now for gynecology, cardiology, dermatology, neurosurgery, neurology, orthopedics. Um, every, I can't think of a specialty where there's not a long waiting list. So that means that those patients, while they're waiting, are still ill and getting yes. iller. Okay, so we're managing their chronic care. In a way, we've become the outpatient return. Okay, yes. where these patients would have been seen maybe in hospital treated and they would have been 
seen in the outpatients. Now we've become, we're doing what secondary care used to do. We're managing patients for long periods of time. And so, and then, I mean, there's so many things you could talk about. There's so many things that are wrong, but like that in, that in itself is a huge problem. And, uh, and that workload is unsustainable in a budget that is fixed. You know, our, our budget is fixed. We cannot keep taking on new workload and compressing what we do every year on year. We just can't do it. It's just physically and financially impossible to do it. And I, I, I don't know where it's going, to be honest, Martin. Like, I mean, like, I'm part of the reason why I'm here is because I, I'm looking for solutions. I want a solution because this, you know, what do I, I need to look at my future too. You know, what, 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 what am I looking at in the next five, 10 years? Yes. You know what I, mean? Yeah, I mean, where are you going to be yeah, where at am I gonna be, age? You know? yeah. Like, I mean, you, like, I, I mean, um, Tony, I'll give you an idea what, what happened in my practice. Now, I, 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 I don't want to just talk about my practice, but just to give you an idea, like we, we started off in, 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 in practice when we started off, it was basically we, we set up, we put a plaque on the wall and we waited for patients to come in. Mm. And it was fantastic. It was great life. And we grew with, with the town. We got to know lots of people. And we eventually got to a point where we could grow further. And I, I'm one of these GPs that has moved into a primary care center. Now, people think that's handed to GPs, but I had to invest significantly to get in there with the money that I get from uh, what that I earn in general practice, either through my, my, my public remit through the GMS and through my private. Yeah. So I have invested myself in the town, in the future of general practice in the town. So like, do I have skin in the game? Yes. Am I a vested interest? Absolutely. Do I care about general practice? 100%. I train GPs. I love, I love the specialty. I wouldn't have gotten into it if I didn't. So what are we looking at? Are we looking at uh, just, just we're going to let all that go? Like, what are we looking at? Well, the, the narrative is that the, the more, the better funded, the better capable primary care is the less people then that go on through to, to need care within the hospital system. And that's the narrative we're sold. Yeah. But you're, you're saying actually the opposite is happening. Well, I, I mean, look, you know, general practice is not the only thing that's occurring pays lip service. Okay. There's housing crisis. There's lots of things that they say they're doing things and on the ground, there is no action. Okay. So I, I'm, we're not, we're not singling out general practice as just the only victim. No, there's, a, there's, there's, there's there's huge things going on, but we need a bit of honesty and we need a plan. We actually just need a plan. We need, we need to, like, it's like a plane that's going down a runway and it's picking up speed and it's just going to crash, you know, like it's just going to run right off the runway. There was an interesting thing that happened to, I think it was middle of last week where the Department of Housing won an award for a plan That's for crazy. housing, and I thought this was a, this was what this was actually um, very something that we should be talking about more. That we are world class at saying how we're going to be world class about doing things in the future. <laughs> you know, it's like we have put together um, these these ideas where we're saying you know he's talking about oh Murphy was number seventeen thousand houses to be delivered this year. And we've seen then the statistics that there are six local authorities that haven't built one house. Yeah. So we know the plan is one thing, and yet we know that the actual uh, the, the the shovels in the ground is next to zero. When you talk about the costs and the and the things, what would be the kind of so twenty years ago, a, a God, I'm nearly I was nearly going to use the Leo. We talk about uh, people as uh, customers now, but yeah. they, they are talking in, in yeah. the HSE about customers. I laugh rather, about that. Actually. Yeah, yeah, they're customers rather than patients, and so, you know, same same mentality that's actually coming true. A lot of our yes. um, yeah, departments departments uh, it started with if you remember Irish Water started referring to people and the Department of Social Protection started calling people social social protection were the first to jump on that bandwagon many years ago they jumped on that bandwagon but, and started referring to people as customers but what we need to talk about is okay that that's a, that goes to we know that's a mindset and ideology and uh, almost a market driven yeah uh, uh, it's a service provider it's, it's when you can t- when you can actually turn around and call Peter McVary a service provider as opposed mm-hmm. to somebody who's just basically Bailing out the state of the I'm a HCP, a healthcare provider. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, I'm not a GP or a doctor. I'm just a HCP. But in terms of the in terms of the the, the the workload you speak of, like what are we? If you could give me in their lingo, what what numbers are we talking extra? Is it is it ten percent more work? Is it fifteen percent more work? And is it in, in, know, in, ter- in, in terms of what you in the, over the last decade, say well, since 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 the crash, since the financial crash, 
Well, it's it's hard it's hard to quantify. I mean, people are doing it. They're trying. I mean, I think probably it's where the Department of Health and HSE and the minister figures. I mean, they are completely underestimating the uh, number of visits yeah. to general practice. I mean, the average patient with a medical card would probably come to the GP about five times a year. And uh, there may be other times where they make contact with the GP for other things like social welfare certs or for prescriptions or other things. But uh, you're probably looking at five visits, mm. you know, and, you know, uh, the the contract that we have at the moment for the medical card patients um, was meant to be changed when it reached 40% of the population. Um, um, actually, I think it's a, a, a smaller than that, but I mean, we are looking at that at this stage that we're covering 40% of the population, but, um, you know, I, I mean, that's a lot of visits. And then, you know, the other problem is, I mean, they're not looking at this at all, is that the population is aging significantly. Mm. I mean, it, it has been mentioned with the pension crisis because that might have an impact on what they're taking in for their own departments. But the the pension crisis is going to have huge implications, or the aging crisis is going to have huge implications for healthcare because, you know, you're looking at patients. The, uh, uh, you know, I, I was at a, a an ICGB conference recently, and uh, Dr. Austin Byrne. Um, presented a slide showing uh, like it's like it's actually like a plane lifting off from uh, a runway the, the the aging population from now on and how the level actually it doesn't it, it's it, just, it doesn't, it's just it doesn't off, yeah it know? doesn't creep up slowly it's it, it actually yeah. it, I, I mean we're, we're we're a victim of our success in some ways our life expectancy has increased and so people are going to live longer that, that means that they're, they're the amount of illnesses a person is going to experience in their life is going to increase on um, uh, people as they get older. I mean, anyone who has a parent, you know, a dad or a mom or a granny knows how many medications there are for different illnesses and how that has to be managed. And that that it involves a, a workload and it ver- involves a commitment from primary care to manage it. And it there has to be a net, there has to be a framework to do that. You know? Well, we know in other countries they spend 7 to 8% of their healthcare budget yeah. goes on on primary care yeah what well, we know in ireland that it's less than half that it's about three yeah. percent in ireland so we know and this is this is chronic underfunding going on for years and years and years this is not flash in the pan underfunding this is underfunding that has gone on for 20 years this yeah. underfunding has gone on mm. medical care means people will live longer but it doesn't mean they live healthier they the multi conditions into old age and that's normal that's what happens with people as you get older, you get sick, you get illnesses. Um, there's no input there to, to look down the pipe a little and say, 10 years from now, our population is going to be X percent over 65 with X predicted cases. We need to fund. We, we, need, to, we need to really project, okay? Because yeah. look, if you look at the cost, like if you look at what's being spent in primary care, right? And I'm talking about, when I talk about primary care, I'm not just talking about GPs. I'm talking about all the facets of primary care. So that would be like the, the community pharmacist, the drugs that patients are getting, um, you know, the public health nurse, the occupational therapists, the home helps, all of that stuff. If you look at that, right, most of that budget is taken up by drugs. Yes. Okay. Now, if you're looking at an aging population um, that's escalating, the proportion of the, the increased budget is uh, that's going to be taken up by drugs is going to continue to increase. Okay, so you have to plan for that as well. So we're going to. Have, I think we're going to have to get very dynamic. I mean, personally, I think we're going to have to start looking at, you know, how we buy drugs, what drugs we use, how you know, all of that stuff. I know there has been germinal stuff about that in, in the HSE, but there's always like in Ireland, there's always an out. Mm. You know, like you know, uh, you know. Um, you, you, you know, they'll want you to prescribe generically. So you prescribe generically and the patient will go in, oh, that doesn't work for me. I don't like the taste or, you know, that doesn't have the same effect as this drug, even though they should, but um, they often don't as sometimes the, 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 the drug delivery is different. So you can be caught with certain expensive drugs um, that are being prescribed. And then you have the high tech drugs, which has just gone crazy. I mean, the high tech drug thing is, is, is just, and for, like the, the other question we're going to have to seriously ask is, okay, high-tech drugs, they're new, they're sexy, 
they save some people's lives. But we don't know the overall benefits. We don't know, we don't know the cost benefit ratio here yet for a lot of these drugs. But there's this pressure that comes on. And, you know, you know, it's, you know, the Joe Duffy campaign or the, um, the, uh, you know, you know, some, uh, patient group or something happens where, you know, we must have this drug. And okay, you have that drug, but that has to be taken out of the final budget. So I think we need to start punching above our weight. I think we need to start saying like, what really works? Where, what do we get the most value for with the little spend? And we really need to be doing that. Like not just saying it, we need to be doing it. We actually need to start behaving like adults, not teenagers in health. I remember a few months back, we were lucky enough to have uh, Simon McGarr sit here, one of our early, early conversations. And he spoke um, about the fact that the 35-year-old, the 45-year-olds rule the, the voting world now because they're the biggest voting block. And he also made the point that, th- that they were going to uh, demand, uh, he, he called it a health crisis that was coming on the basis that their parents were going to start developing all sorts of, and as you said, living longer, developing other illnesses, um, things like you know uh, dementia and things that are on the rise because yeah. people are living longer. These things are, are more prevalent. Um, but what does it mean today that if like you know if, if I wanted to join a G, get a GP in a rural town, uh, can I can I if I, I just move to that town? What are, what are my odds now? Am, am I <laughs> you know? Because I hear we hear all these uh, these stories of people who can't get into a GP because the GP is literally full. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that is a big issue. I mean, I, I mean, Alana Duffy is a GP in uh, in Monaghan. Shane Cor is another one that 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 have have talked a lot about this, where their lists are fairly full. They're having people retiring out of their surgeries. Um, it's 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 real crisis stuff. I mean, this is not this is not make believe. This is the real deal. And I mean. Like if you like, you might find the m- nicest house you ever had in Leitrim. Mm. Beautiful view, and the schools the schools look reasonable for your children. And okay, you're going to accept a commute or whatever to Dublin or whatever it is. But you know what happens that you know what happens when your children need their vaccinations? What happens when your children are unwell? Um, you know, what about the out of hours? What what are we going to do with all of this stuff? You know, we need to have a plan. We need to have a plan. Like it's not enough. It's not enough to say, oh, you know, we support primary care, which, listen, I, I've been listening to most of my adult life, and I haven't seen it emerge yet. And I know you've talked to many speakers on the, on the podcast because I've listened to them where they've talked about this. And, you know, it's just like we, we have to go beyond this surface. We need to see a plan, mm. you know. And the GMS contract is up for renegotiation. Yeah, well, that's been up re- for renegotiation for years. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would be very deeply cynical about... Um, about the two big parties having really any kind of real meaningful need to negotiate a contract. I mean, look, if you were them, this is ideal. You know, like you have no accountability in general practice. Yes. It's some dude who works in a small town. Uh, he's responsible for his patient. It's his headache. Why Why make your life more difficult by negotiating a contract where you, you have to fund them properly or you you might have to take responsibility when you don't fund them properly. Or if something goes wrong. If something goes wrong. Yeah. Um, they don't want that. They, you know, I mean, I, like I, what I what I really love about the HSE and the Department of Health and the Minister for Health is this idea that if somebody, if a GP retires out of out of a community that's been served by a GP for, for, for 30 years, they feel they don't have any responsibility whatsoever beyond a very um, derisory kind of unenthusiastic um, ad on a website yeah. to 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 try to you know pull some young doctor away from the big smoke into uh, 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 a mortgage situation where they have to cap, they have to bill the surgery okay they or have to rent the surgery or um, lease the surgery they have to uh, hmm. get staff for the surgery manage the staff, manage the utilities, insurance. get the insurance, not only the insurance for the building, but their own medical insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then, you know, how does this guy take a break, you know, or how does this young woman take a break if there's no doctors around to, to cover them when they're going on holidays? I mean, who the hell would do it? Yeah. I mean, there's GPs in this country who are not taking annual leave because there's no one to cover their practice when they're gone. 
Well, we've we've spoken about the general medical services contract. You and I have spoken about it quite a bit, and yeah. I maintain that it's it's a fifty year old, almost a fifty year old contract in a very changed situation. Oh, completely changed, Martin. Like, I, I I mean, like high tech then was an ECG. Yes, Do you know what yes, I mean? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I mean, the, the contract is not fit for purpose, and, and my view on it is that one size does not fit all. There are GPs who are clinic managers, clinic providers, on top of being GPs. There are GPs who work in clinics who have to be approved by the HSC so that they can work in that clinic. There are GP surgeries who do 100% state, and there are GP surgeries who do 100% private. Now, that contract cannot cover everybody. It just simply cannot cover everybody well, it's in not, every situation. Well, well, it's very distinct because what it does is it, it, it just solely covers uh, the uh, remuneration to the GP of services provided to medical care patients. It's very it's very clear and it, it's very much you know passing that role on to the GP and passing that responsibility onto the GP. Well, there are, there's, there's, there's a lot of, like when you look at the contract, there's a lot of responsibility on the GP, yeah. 24-7, 365 day cover. And that's why GPs are not, like GPs buy into that. And they have they have bought into that. Um, and uh, to the detriment of their health, to the detriment of their family lives, to the detriment of, of uh, um, so many things in their life. And, uh, and, the pro- and look, that's fine. Okay, if people want to do that, that's fine. But the new generation are not going to do that. And they would be crazy to do it. It's easier money. It's easier money the, made elsewhere. Well, I, let's just put it this way. There, the, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's careers where you're, you're support, where you feel more supported. You are more supported, and your, your, you, your life is more structured. There's I a better think, quality of life. Way better quality. T- taking of life. the taking taking Martin's mercenary approach out of it. It's not. It doesn't boil down to you know just the money well, in your it's pocket. The same I know. The reason they can't get to get doctors in hospitals. I mean, if you're going to be in a nightmare situation. To, 24-7 in that hospital. Why would you, go, why would but, you put yourself up for But it's funny how we, we talked about, look, you said about uh, needing a plan. We know, um, as we, we've mentioned at the outset, uh, Solange Care, but we've also seen, um, you said about you know the, the, the lack of money, but we've seen the making it up as you go along kind of uh, philosophy that we have. We've seen it around the cervical check um, scandal where they came out and they said, you know, oh, no one will have to go to court ever again and we'll just, we'll pay them and then we'll pursue the labs. And it caused a lot. First of all, it actually has created a, a real problem around the actual cervical check, which saves lives, where, where it's created this thing where people seem to think that, you know, oh, you can't even trust them. We know statistically that's not true. It does save lives. It's, mm. you know. Well, I mean, the cervical smear, like, like to put it in context, right? The cervical smear, cam- the, um, the cervical check is, is a, like a national program to reduce the incidence of cervical cancer in the country. And it has done it, okay? The problem is how it's done, mm. okay? Any screening, any screening um, uh, uh, program has risks mm. to the patients and, and the risks are from false positives and false negatives, okay? So what does that mean in, in practice, okay? You, you have a false negative, okay? It, what it's saying to the, to the lady is that, you know, the cells we picked up are not pre-malignant when they were, okay? There is not a screening program in the world that doesn't have a rate of false negatives, okay? What you try to do and why you audit a system is to limit the amount of false negatives there are. You can do that in a number of ways. You can, you know, reevaluate the way you're screening the cells, how you're taking the cells, the samples in the first place, um, how often you call people back. But again, it's, it has to be based on, you know, you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to limit harm. And what, mm. I, and what I mean by limiting harm is that you're not over-investigating women, that you're not under-investigating them either, that it's not too expensive where it's not actually beneficial to the state. Um, it, the taxpayer, when I say the state, that you know, that the taxpayer is getting good value for money, that they're getting the best outcomes. And then you have the false positive thing, which and the false positive thing is where women are told that they do have pre-malignant cells. Mm-hmm. And then they have to go through a process of treatment that, that is unnecessary. And th- that's something you don't want either. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want pe- women treated like that either. So the, the, the cervical smear thing, I mean, is, it was really badly handled by the government. I mean, it was handled from the, from the moment it started from a political point of view, not a medical one. Mm-hmm. And 
there was very little thought in the, in, for the women involved. Yes. And um, it, it just makes me very angry when I watch the whole thing. I mean, like, like the, the, the success, like, I'll tell you the success of the Spike with Smear program, right? Since it's been introduced, like before it was introduced, there was a 4% increase in cervical cancer year on year, okay? Since it's come in, every year that it's been operational, there's been a decrease in cervical cancer incidence by 7%. By any stretch of the imagination, that is a hugely successful screening program. And we need to, we need to laud that, we need to appreciate that, and we need to see the value of it. But we also, that doesn't stop us from looking at it properly and mm. going through all that stuff. But that, don't even start me on this right with me, I think. That's just. I know, I know. You know I, I mean, like it, but, I can, <laughs> but I can come back to it on the basis of, of, of putting a purely, as you said, um, in there, there was a sentence you used about uh, value for money and, and, and the tax, to the taxpayer. And that's where we get, that's where we always run up against trouble here in, in, in yeah. whether it be survival well, check pastel. or it be any, yes, but it be, whatever it be, whatever the case be, it be housing, it yeah. be any of this, we always get it, we always come up against this. And, you know, I, I'm going to even broaden it out even further where yesterday we had the launch of 11 affordable houses up the road and um, by, by Hugh Brennan's O'Coolan Cooperative and they did 11 homes. They can build them for 160,000 euro. And the state pays 360,000 to their private developer bodies when, when, as part of Owen Murphy's rebuild in Ireland policy. Now, rebuild in Ireland and Fine Gael were all over this yesterday and they didn't receive, they didn't, they didn't even proffer the one cent of funding towards it. Dublin City Council offered the sites at 1,000 euro per site. Okay. That's what made, that's, that was the one. Made it affordable. Yes, well, they, may, they didn't have to pay for the land in effect, okay? Yeah. But then they deliver back a non-profit and they build a house and, they, and they, you get it for 163000 I mean, that's an affordable, that's less than what typical rents are around. Yeah. So so you have a quality of life built into that. Those models, I know it's not the same bloody thing, but there's an ideological problem we keep coming up against in this state. Will you say to me that, that we are underfunding, chronically underfunding GPs to the tune of half what the EU or EU average is, okay? Yeah. It's the same thing when we come to our, we give out about our buses, yet we're the lowest um, state intervention yeah. in the in the in the EU as well. So you know you can't keep underfunding these things. You keep talking about how you can get more efficient and how you need to do this and do that, and do, and, and I'm just not hearing it coming back from the other side. You know? Well, I mean, I think look, if you look at every year, like what the thing that always makes me laugh about the, about the, the budgeting and health is at every single year. The HSE come at the end of the year and say we've run over budget. Yeah, we want okay. more money. Every single year, okay? Now, general practice is on a fixed budget. Whatever I get, I get. It ain't going to go over it, and that's the same for all GPs. I, I mean, we're running extremely efficiently, the most efficient service. And where have the costs increased? The costs have increased to the state for things like the under sixes. Because they did not listen to us about the under sixes that the kids would, would 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 visit more, and they did not listen to us that the kids would come out of hours more because parents would want to go to work, and bring their children when it was more convenient. Like one GP down in Cork said to me, down in Cork the 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 uh, the under sixes is called the after sixes. <laughs> so the after sixes is the crash wings the mom or the dad um, who are at work, uh, the child has a selfie nose. They come home, have their dinner. They go to the GP out of hours service, making the GP out of service extremely busy, um, increasing the workload of GPs who already have worked all day long in their surgeries and have rushed out of their surgeries to get up to the out of hours on call. And then they're seeing all these under six children for free. And the state is paying what is called a special type consultation for these children, which is like, uh, I think it's like something in the region of 40 euros per child. That was a fact. That was a fee that they didn't factor in to their accounting, mm, yes. and now that's an additional fee. Now that at the end of the year, you'll see the Minister of Health talking about how there's been an increase in the GP budget, but the increase in the GP budget has been from their mess up. Every single time, though, every yeah. single time a state says we're spending more than, than ever than in the history of the state, the challenge needs to be kicked back. Of, of course, we are. First of all, that's what capitalism does. It expects infinite growth. Okay. We, we need, we prices, inflation go up. People are living longer. There are more people around. We need, we need, you said, you know, tech drugs, all this. If prices, if this wasn't going up, 
it goes up everywhere. Look at the housing budget. We're burning a billion quid on HAP and housing assisting payments. Up to four billion in 2020. And it's going to, and that's the problem, Martin. It doesn't go up incrementally. Yeah. Okay, Tony. So say you're the guy, say you're the guy who um, writes into the newspaper or tweets that I paid 60 euros to the GP mm. and I only, you know, he did nothing for me. He just gave me a prescription and I sent out, right? Mm. Okay. Let's let's talk about what. It Stop means. reading my tweets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, but let's let's just talk. Let's just talk about that. Let's talk to that person. Okay. Let's forget about everybody else. The people who maybe utilize the GP more, maybe have more of awareness. Let's talk to the person who thinks GP is a waste of time. What countries in the world have poor general practice? The worst general practice, the United States. Mm. It's the most expensive health service in the world it is. by far, and it, it 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 just their their costs are running at an insane level. Okay. And they are like, if you have been reading any of the medical journals for the last 30 years, all they're talking about is bringing back the generalists to the United States. The idea of somebody who can look at the person in as in this modern awful phrase, holistically. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the holistic, and what we mean by that is looking at the whole, all the different systems, the cardiovascular system, the lung, the gastrointestinal, everything, the mm-hmm. social, psycho, psychosocial, everything. Okay. And that's what general practice does, okay? And there's a huge value in that because you get, you can actually tailor the treatment specifically to the needs of the patient in front of you. It can be absolutely individualized, okay? If you're just going to, gen- like, if you're in the States and you have a rash in your hand, you don't go to your GP, you go to your dermatologist. And your der- dermatologist checks you out and he goes, well, it's not a dermatology problem. You need to see a hematologist. And then you go to a hematologist. And the hematologist tells you, well, it's not a hematology problem. You need to go and see somebody else. And, you know, that's great, but it's hugely expensive. And it doesn't, it, there's no, there's no intrinsic link to the patient. And that's, that's the value. Like, it's cost effective. But also, one of the big changes that has come in in GP practice in Ireland is you do have people who present where well, you, you must take a history, where well, you must look at the person. Yeah. And you're expected to do this in this tiny little time frame. Yeah. And if you've got somebody in who was suicidal or who, what, you can't say, your 10 minutes is up, get out the door. Yeah, but you see, we have time in general practice. Like, yeah. that's what people forget. Like, and, and, and the people, like, I, I know there'll be GPs listening to this. What did you just say? No, but like, I always say this to my trainees because I train young doctors to be GPs. So if anyone's listening to this and think that I'm a hopeless case and that I think the end of the world is nigh, I don't, okay? I, just, I, I, I wouldn't do what I do unless I thought that we could save it, okay? But what I say to the young doctors that come in, okay, is that, look, we're seeing illness at a very early stage, much earlier than they see in hospital. Nothing's very obvious, okay? And that, that, that has benefits and uh, challenges, okay? But the, the major benefit is that we have time, okay? So you can try things, cheaper options, uh, you can ex- you can explore other different treatments earlier on that can nip things in the bud and that can save a huge amount of money down the line where things don't become chronic or don't become uh, disabling. Mm. And that's the value to general practice. And I try to, like, it's very hard to get that across to the public. But that's that's what the government want. They want to, uh, that's what they tell us they want. They, they want a want primary that. care system that takes the pressure off acute care within the hospital system. Well, what it actually is is a stopgap because, you, as you said, you, if you have 10,000 children waiting on one particular waiting list, they're probably being cared for. You know, you are you have an 18-month lead into when they're actually going to see someone in on this. And in the meantime, they're in, in and out of the GP rec- receiving a stopgap care to try and... Yeah, but I, th- I think the HSC and the Department of Health see GPs has gone rogue. You know? Mm. And, I, and I, what I mean by that is that we, 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 we're too close to the patient. Mm. That that uh, we are not part of the team. We don't see them as customers. We yeah. see them as human beings. Uh, I mean, look, if if you really went by the customer thing, okay, all right. Let's imagine that the patient is a customer, right? If you went to McDonald's and you were ordering a burger, right, and you're up at the the counter and you, the guy goes, "What do you want?" and you're going. I'm sorry, you're taking too long. You have to go down to the back of the queue. That's what validation is. Yeah. Real life is intruded on that person while they were making the decision whether they ordered a quarter pounder with cheese or a Big Mac. But the business doesn't just doesn't value them, so it sends them to the back of the queue. Yeah. Okay. That only happens in a, in in a in a in a business frame where 
it, you're going to get the same money whether you see the patient or not. Mm. Yeah. No business operates like that. Yeah. No business operates like that. Every person matters because that's your bottom line. Yeah. So if they really saw patients as customers, there would be no waiting lists. There would be nothing. There would be no delays in anything. That's the thing that really bothers me about that language. That language is really, really, it, it's, it, it's beyond insensitive. It's mm. just a lie. Well, we, we, you know, we would call it. Would you agree with that? Language. Yeah, well, listen, we fight against the, the the subtle changes in language all the time. It, there, there's, ah, we, just... We've seen the attacks. We've seen the attacks on on on. We'll, I'll go to a very broad thing where where we've heard a, a T-shirt four times say that communications was a uh, was no, doesn't communications yeah, a virtue. virtue. Yeah, it's not. It's just a way of talk. Con, con, what he meant was, I want my strategic communications unit. I want my five million euro for that. But, and 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 then we get accused of what about her? Because they say, oh, you say, oh, don't stop bringing up his five million. And I go, well, you know, would it not be better off paying for, you know, childcare for, 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 uh, for kids returning to school now where we see where these things are going? It's all linked. <laughs> but they, they do what about her? Yes. You know, like they, like they do the what about her about, you know, what about Europe or yeah. how will we be seen on the international markets or, you know, and, you know, I don't think the international markets really notice us all too much. Well, I think we could have flown homes. under the radar a couple of times quite easily. Yeah, well, you saw, um, you saw Apple yesterday <laughs> announced that they've, they've given two thirds of the money, uh, yeah, has been yeah. handed over. We, we are so bad. Like, I mean, not, imagine not even collecting the money. So oh, no. Please don't give us the money that we really, really, really need. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> of course, 13 billion into primary health care would, would transform the health system within, I would transform the health system right across our Yeah, but I, I mean, I, 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 when, I, when I'm talking like this, I don't want people who are listening to think that, like, I want more money in my salary. I just want a plan. Like, the thing about it is, like, I will survive. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because I'm a GP, I've already survived. I know I can survive, okay? Um, I'm talking about a future, all right? I'm talking about what are we doing training so many young doctors? Like, I, I, I've trained... Um, six trainees now. I'm six, uh, six years in the UCD uh, West Midlands game, and uh, or the uh, Dublin Midlands just game, and um, the the uh, you know they're great. You know, I mean they they blow me away. They're so good. Like they are so good. They're so well trained. And it's not because of my training. It's because of the collective training. They get two years in general practice and two years in um, secondary care medicine and different specialties. They are very broad ranging people who enjoy life, who live life, who have a lot to offer their patients. And it has been a huge boon to my practice to have these young people in my practice in the sense that I get patients coming in saying, you know, how great they were. Oh, it was terrible that they're gone or how, how great she was, how terrible she's gone. You know, don't lose them. They're fantastic. Mm. I mean, that's what you want to hear if you're training somebody. Yeah. But we're losing them. I mean, not only are we losing them, we're giving them away. Yeah. Like we're, we are actually giving these people to Canada and to Australia and New Zealand and to England and to all over Europe and to now, now to like, uh, Saudi Arabia and the Arab Emirates and all these countries. I mean, what are we doing? Uh, seriously, like, what are we doing? We, we have this fantastic, like, okay, Leo, Simon, if you're listening, we have this great product. Okay. <laughs> and it's like a really good product and we should, you know, uh, this is a fantastic product. Why don't you, uh, encourage this product in our country you know i mean god we could actually produce gps for the rest of the world that's how good we are training yeah and charge premium for and it charge too. a premium yeah, for yeah, it. yeah absolutely you know like they talk about you know forcing uh trainees to stay for two years why don't we charge other countries to take our trainees yeah we yeah. train these guys so damn well i don't you know these guys we're talking about people who have a very limited uh, imagination yeah, well, I think that is the problem. You and know, we've come across that, and we can say that. Super hard. communicators. Yeah. You know, super communicators. Well done on Repeal the Eighth, Simon. Um, like, super communicators. When they want something across the wire, they get it across the wire. Yeah. Okay? So, you know, you know, all they need is is the uh, the, the paperwork, the, the speech written for them, and they'll stand up in that podium, and they will sell it. They will sell us. Oh, yeah. They will sell us into poverty like they did. 10 years ago. Okay. <laughs> so they, these guys are good salespeople. So let's get them selling the right thing, I think. And we need a plan. Okay. So GP that, care. I don't know. I agree. Does that make sense? And, you know, my personal experience without GP care, I, I mean, I wouldn't be walking around. GP care kept me going through the roughest of times. And I have to say it did. 
So I'm all for, let's have a GP, let's hope that everybody can have the same experience mm -hmm. I've had through GP care. Mm -hmm. Everybody. And you'd end up with the results being better in the longer term. And that's all that matters to people. Mm -hmm. Will they live longer, healthier? Will, if you get your GP service in order and have a plan going forward for it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks, thanks. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, no, um, no. Honestly, Stephen, I think it's a, it's a great conversation because it's not one that you're not going to hear um, very much out out in the out in the mainstream that, that that these things because we tend to we tend to broadcast on on the on the latest crisis or whatever just happened to happen particularly today. You know, you know, a Trump tweet will 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 will, will go uh, will go will go. Well, on, GPs are generally, and you'll forgive me for saying this, middle class, mild mannered people. They're not people who are going to be out stomping on the streets. They're not people who are going to be kicking up well, look, a whole I'm, lot of force. I'm not political, you know. Yeah. I'm not political. I mean, I, 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 I'm, in, I look. I'm a small business owner, an That's SME. Right. That's what we are. That's yeah. what we are. And okay, um, I, you know, we we employ staff. We care about our staff. We care about our patients. You know, always remember. You know, they're very committed doctors and nurses in this country. They have a very low incidence of sick leave. Yeah, the lowest. In, in the uh, doctors in particular have the lowest sick leave in the health service. And, you know, you can say what you like about their commitment to their patients, but that says something to me. Well, I, every know? every family in this country has a family GP, yeah. and we call them family GPs for a reason. Yeah. And we but, want to be that, yeah. you know? And we we want to call be it, I mean, it, it, you can't replace that with a computer screen or no. Google. You can't replace it. No. Right. Um, guys, thanks for listening, folks. Do hit subscribe, leave us a review, tell your friends. This is really now, you know, it, I know Martin's been, uh, been, been plugging it all, but, but we could really, we could really do with a few of you coming on board. We have, we have, a, we have a few Patreon links going up there. Have and a look. We will be organizing a night before, uh, we'll say before the summer is over shortly for, uh, guests, a little awards ceremony and that. We'll let you know more about that when it comes up, but everybody's welcome. Talk to you soon, folks. Take care. Bye-bye.